Hello, everybody. I'm Shane. I'm Ken. And welcome to Gem Talk. Welcome to episode 9 of Gem Talk, where we are going to cover the first week of the extreme summer of Steven. Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, we are no strangers to Steven bombs, but what has been unloaded upon us this month is just completely spectacular. We're only one week in, and I'm already uh, extremely happy with what we've seen. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to have, I believe it's four solid weeks yeah. of episodes, and... This first week um, starts off pretty good. Pretty oh, yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do, uh, unlike our normal episodes where we kind of sit down and pick apart every tiny little piece of the episode that we can, uh, since we have five episodes to work with, we're going to hit the major points and try to talk about the overarching themes of the week and see if uh, what we can pull out of it without delving too, too deep. Yeah. This is a bit of a different format, so hopefully we won't end up with an episode that's too, too long. Nah, I'll make sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's just get uh, right into this. Uh, let's start with the first episode of this week, which was Drop Beat Dead. Yes. Where we see the return of Marty after many years. Marty! <laughs> and we also get uh, some more time with Sour Cream, and we get to see a little bit of all that relationship with Sour Cream and Vidalia and Yellow Marty. Yellowtail and Marty, Ye yeah. Yellowtail, yes. Um, yeah, and I think the, the first interesting thing that they show is actually about Steven, and in only a few short seconds, they show that Steven's grown exponentially in strength since the last time we've really seen him demonstrate anything, in that he can carry not only that large box in the beginning, but an entire, like, instrument box or something. Yeah. yeah. I think that was one of the big, long speakers they had on top of the building later yeah. on. Yeah, you can just completely and, do that without and, any trouble. And just from one end. Oh, yeah. I mean, that... I mean, speakers are heavy mm -hmm. if nobody's ever carried around a speaker before. <laughs> yes. So the fact that he's been able to do those things, I mean, Marty says it himself, like, what's Greg been feeding this kid? <laughs> so we start off with uh, Steven describing what it's like to be a roadie. And it doesn't seem to matter what occupation or lifestyle that Steven's envisioning. He's always got this really rosy um, look on it. It's just that ever-present optimism that makes Steven such a lovable character. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I can imagine his father uh, possibly uh, regaling him with tales of his musical career and then talking about how difficult it was and how great it would have been if he had a roadie and maybe that uh, sort of tinting his vision positively about what roadies do because I'm sure that Marty really never sprung for roadies uh, when, oh yeah, uh, it was Greg just was the young. two of them. Yeah. yeah, but his description of what it's like to be a roadie reminds me a lot about what it was like to be a no homeboy in On the Run, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was this very idealistic, romantic concept of what it was like to be uh, homeless. Oh yeah, <laughs> in like the boxcar area. You know, Greg's a uh, car wash. Yeah. It's a wash. Yes, never busy. No, in always fact, a slow day at in, the car wash. It seems. <laughs> A slow day at the car wash. Um. Anyway, it seems like sour cream even just uses it as a bathroom. Like yeah. people would more so stop there to use the bathroom than to actually use it as a car wash. Right. And like at one point he was trying to sell guitar lessons, and it's like, yeah, he runs this thing, but he tried to wash Yellowtail's boat once. Yeah. <laughs> and he washed uh, Mayor Dewey's van, but that was for free. That was yeah. for political favors. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, Greg obviously still very much in need of money at this point. Yeah, so we start off with the uh, the equipment that uh, Sour Cream has. Uh, Yellowtail shows up and they get into an argument that you only understand half of. It's the typical, I want you to go into the family business. I don't want to go into the family business. I want to do my own thing. Yeah. And that, that very classic clash, it, it doesn't help that um, Yellowtail is his stepdad, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. kind of like diminishes that It adds on that, uh, you're not my real dad sort of right. trope to the whole thing. Yeah. And then he meets his real dad. Yeah. Um. And Marty just 
looks absolutely ridiculous. Let's just set aside the clash of his age with the more uh, hip or uh, trendy looking gear. Um, Not to mention the language that he tries to use, too. Yeah, real talk. Yeah, real talk. (laughs) And, you know, just so you know, real Real talk. talk. (laughs) Uh, but the the equipment that he's wearing, um, the the gear, whatever you want to call it, the clothing is just he's got like a leather jacket, boxy looking shades that are golden color. He's got yeah. a golden chain holding his wallet in. Everything that he's wearing is just so tacky. Yeah, you got somebody who looks like he's got to be at least in his late forties, at yeah. least. Trying to look like a 20-something. But that's... I, I think that's just commentary on the biz. You know, the musical biz. Yeah. You gotta be young, hip, edgy in order to stay relevant. Mm. And I think that what we're seeing is Marty actually on the dregs of his uh, capability of being in that business. Right. Which is why he's selling out so much. Yeah, the the anachronism is so apparent. Mm-hmm. The thing is... With Sour Cream wanting to be a DJ and Marty being a promoter, a pro motor, motor. yeah, <laughs> this should be like a match made in heaven here. You know, they should be able to work together and actually get a career going. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take it for granted that Sour Cream's good at being a DJ, yeah, but no, Marty's a creep. And yeah. he did it for himself. Yeah, and I think, again, the problem is when he starts talking about the guacola, which, first of all, I don't know about you guys, but I'd try it. I'm not going to say it's good, <laughs> but I'd try it. But it's not even good on chips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, no. Like, I'm not a fan of guacamole or anything made with avocado, except maybe a piece and some sushi at some yeah. point. But... I'm not a fan of guacamole, so the idea that someone would liquefy that and put it in carbonated water... I mean, water... it's already almost liquid. I like strange drinks. Leave me alone. Yeah. What I thought was interesting is that when he starts talking about it, he says he needs the deal. Yes. Um, that's desperation. So mm-hmm. clearly things aren't going as great as he'd like us to believe. And I think that's what's happening is that he's starting to reach a point in his uh, age where he can't be the cool hip face of his own musical career anymore and he needs to make money wherever he can and at this point he's transitioned into selling himself to fast food uh soda industry anything to get a quick contract that if he strikes it big may end up making him millions of dollars i may even go so far as to say that most of the money he made from the pepe's burger shtick probably ended up going to Greg, and now he needs a new Patsy to make another uh, cool buck on. That's an interesting point, because if Greg got $10 million and the agent gets a cut, Mm -hmm. then the math is weird here, but he would have had maybe $200,000 or something like that from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a decent amount of money. Yes. But it's hard to tell how long ago this promotion was done, because... In the commercial they show you at the beginning of the second episode, Mr. Mm-hmm. Greg, Marty still it looks, looks like Marty's being used as a model. Yeah. Because it looks like him. Yeah. But it's the younger him. Definitely way younger than he looks in Drop Beat Dad. Yeah, it looks like it's only shortly after we see him in the first flashback episode. Which raises a couple questions. One, is he giving Greg this money now because he went to get the Guacola deal, they found out that he wasn't on the up and up with the Pepe's Burgers thing and had to, you know... Fix it. Yeah. My other thought was that he might have had a turn of conscience about it. But based on how the rest of the episode turns out, that's probably not what happened. Yeah. Because we had speculated in the previous episode what was going on here Mm -hmm. with the promos that we had seen. Oh, yeah. And one of the things was, oh, maybe he got this deal and he was going to pocket the money and not say anything to Greg about it. But then some legal entity came down on him about it, so he had to quickly save face. Yeah, and he does say that he's legally obligated to give it to Greg. So, I mean, we may have been very close, if not right on the money, with that one. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Pun intentional. So so anyway, you have this more or less a montage. Sour Cream wants to be a DJ. Here's a guy who's got the equipment. He's got the industry know-how, as far as he says. Yeah. Sour cream is just caught up into it. On top of that, 
is Marty saying, oh, we need to rebond, like, father-son stuff. Yeah. You know? The moment when Steven sees there's other roadies, um, and Steven's like, well, I guess I'll just carry myself home now. And, and then uh, at that point, I was be like, okay, here's that thing where it's like he's trying to drive a wedge between Steven and Sour Cream or mm -hmm. something. But then he hands him a badge. Yeah. And so... In this episode, aside from the fact that Marty just looks like a creep and talks like a creep, you know, I uh, I was wanting to believe it, that this was good, yeah. up until the moment of the soda thing. Well, that's the thing. Marty is good at being a creep because he's really good at making you think he's the good guy or that he's changed. Even the whole real talk situation, even though we, we kind of uh, made fun of it there, he was... Using that as a means to get them to trust him. Yeah. And he himself. even, yeah, he even insulted himself. I was dumb. I made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. But those things aren't going to happen anymore because I've learned a lot about myself. And you want to believe that somebody can change for the better. Um, but the problem is that, no, he is just a crappy person. And he's using this idea of promoting Sour Cream's rave as a way to promote his cola thing, which yeah. is terrible on, the, <laughs> on, on top of it. So, during the rave, the soda comes out, he, uh, beans Ronaldo with it, and isn't that, like, isn't there this old cartoon of somebody, like, getting hit with a football? It's The Simpsons. It's, it's from The Simpsons. The Simpsons Okay. Did. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Internet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the Hans Molman Productions, uh, That's Man right. Getting Hit with a Football. That's right. It was exactly that, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, and there's also a Zoolander reference um, in this episode, yeah, where uh, Marty asks if this is a concert for ants, and that's a reference to the, uh, is this a school for ants uh, from the movie Zoolander? Wow. At the point after we find out that Marty is being a bit of an, a douchebag about all of this, Sour Cream starts to ma 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 at <laughs> Marty, and this kind of um, touches on one of the things I've been interested in, which is Yellowtail's dialect. What is he saying? Is it a different language? Is he just, uh, is, is it being perceived as a different language? And my one camp, what I sort of believed prior to this episode, was that the mama mumming is equivalent to the womp womp womping in, uh, <laughs> in peanuts. the Peanuts, yes. Yeah. It's um, the adults are talking. Yeah, yeah, where anything that's either too mature or too dry or anything like that just comes across as this dull sort of droning sound. Um, but I did actually, while watching this episode again, come up with a second potential theory, which is that the mama mumming may be uh, actually adult language it may be too aggressive it might actually include swearing because mm. something to note when sour cream starts yelling angrily that's when he starts using the muzz mm -hmm. and when he finishes uh marty says what did you just say to me so, so uh, sort of a, an offended taken aback sort of oh that's interesting yeah i hadn't seen it like that Do and mm -hmm. to cap it off okay. it means that Sour Cream started talking like Yellowtail, which means he started talking like a sailor. I was I was wondering if you were going to bring that up. Yeah. Because Yellowtail's a sailor. Yeah. Okay, yeah. My take on it is that it's a nondescript for the case of the show, foreign language. Mm -hmm. Like, rather than using another foreign language, like, say, Spanish or something. But it was interesting to see him, like, drop into that mama language. Mm -hmm. So... In the end, uh, Yellowtail brings the equipment just when Sour Cream was ready to give up on his dreams and go for, you know, being a fisherman or whatever. Here comes Yellowtail with his boat, and here's the equipment, and they, they have their rave anyway. And everybody's there, including Vidalia, mm -hmm. um, and it's all wonderful. Yeah, and it uh, ends on a high note, and not only that, uh, but when we're about to get the moral of the story, which is... You know, as long as you're doing what makes you happy, you should be, you know, you should be okay in life. Mm -hmm. um, Greg opens up the letter and finds out that it's actually a check for $10 million, mm -hmm. um, which actually leads us right, right into, into Mr. Greg. Tuesday's episode. Yes. This, real talk, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a humongous fan of musicals. Real talk? Yeah. Me too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and real talk. 
<laughs> this was probably my favorite episode of all three, uh, or oh, all five of yes, the episodes. Of this week, this is definitely the best episode. Now, they had said before that there was going to be a, quote, musical episode. Mm-hmm. This is it. There yep. was, like, six songs in here. Uh-huh. And, um... Very little dialogue in between. Mm-hmm. So it could almost be called an opera. Almost. Almost. <laughs> Greg gets his money. Doesn't know what to do with it. We start off with the commercial. Yes, which I now, want to point out. Uh, like a Comet is probably one of my favorite songs in mm-hmm. the entire show. Young Greg is one of my favorite characters. And to see it parodied... It was done so well, in my opinion. Right, even though they were basically parodying themselves. Yes, yeah. even though they only parodied about 30 seconds of it, as it is a commercial, I think it was done beautifully, I thought it was amazing, um, and I really, really just appreciated that as a fan of parody. One little comment about that. I found it a little, almost a little painful to see such a great song turned to, into such a campy... Thing. I realize they're parodying themselves. Yeah. And I do appreciate it on that level. But this would be like taking your favorite like rock song from your childhood and watching somebody twist the lyrics into some <laughs> commercial jingle and you're just like, why? You know? <laughs> um, but that aside. Enough of your artistic soul believing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we see that uh, Pearl is also here. She's the only uh, crystal gem we see in this episode. Yeah. Okay. And... She's confused. You know, well, this is the song he was singing the day that he met Rose. Yeah, but I mean, that's his fault because he kind of implies that this is the exact song when no, it's right. not actually the right. song. And this is what did it? Burgers? Burgers? So there's a question implied there. This this is what did it. You yeah. know, she's she's been seeking something. We find out later in the episode, she's trying to find out why did Rose fall in love with Greg? Yeah. Because what? she can't figure that out. Well, not specifically what made Rose fall in love with Greg. What made Rose choose Greg over her? Right. So they get into, what are going to do with this money? money? And cue the second song. Yes. You know? um, what am I going to do with all this money? Yeah. Don't cost nothing. <laughs> I'm gonna call it, that's what I'm going to call it. Okay. Right? Which is a cute little, little song. And uh, then they decide... Song three, they're going to go to Empire City, yeah. which just sounds like one of those like rock ballads, oh like yeah, Springsteen type of things, oh, yeah. you know. And um, <laughs> I think it's funny that they actually reference uh, real New York locations, including the Bronx. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that uh, like Ian Jones Quarterly has stated in the past that this is an alternate Earth where right. it's the places aren't exactly the same, but obviously they make allusions. But this time it wasn't so much an illusion as a direct reference. Yeah. So they make a big deal about, we're going to go to Empire City and and we'll bring Pearl. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. The, the, the little tag on line at the end. And um, we get to see when the spotlight hits her there. Um, the first of many Pearl reactions in this episode, which I think uh, for all the people out there who make the the GIFs or the oh, icons yeah. or whatever. Of all the Pearl takes. Yeah, yeah. this has got to be a gold mine. Oh, yeah. Because from the moment she's being carried by the group of busboys right. to when uh, she's trying to be fed the steak and brie mm-hmm. to it's just so many of her facial expressions are just spot on beautiful on this episode right right and the um pearl tries to back out of it they're like no come on you know come with us whatever then we get the song that was spoiled song mm-hmm. four which when i saw this in the preview i was like oh this is just like i think i'm gonna like it here from mm-hmm. annie yeah it's the same sort of thing same generic idea. you know we're gonna live in luxury for for a time at least yeah and check out how wonderful this is and everybody's paying attention to us and you know serving us and all this stuff but uh when the song ends Mm -hmm. um it's by pearl and we get that sort of sour note because everything just stops yeah everybody's having a great time and all the moods are getting lifted but again as soon as greg steps in to try and bridge the gap between himself and pearl no she draws that line in the sand and i know we spoke pretty extensively on what that no was all about Mm -hmm. you know and so since we did talk about that already we just move to the next part which is when um greg and steven are asleep Uh uh-huh right and this is one of my favorite songs yeah i think this is my favorite song in the entire episode and it's it's great because we've always talked about 
Pearl's relationship with Rose mm-hmm. and how important it was to her. And they've shown it in Rose's Scabbard and Lion 3 and... Yeah. Um, Chilateed. Chilateed, yes. But she's never really expressed to Stephen how she's really feeling. Now, this song is her pouring her heart out. But I just want to say that the way that this was animated, all of it was just so good. And musically, like the bridge of... Da, 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 like, oh, oh my yeah. God. Everything about <laughs> that, like, minute and a half of the episode is just so delicately, so precisely done that you can just feel not just through the animation, not just through the music, not just through the storytelling, but through everything coming together. You can just feel the love in it, the dedication, the the focus. It's just no, no shortcuts are taken. Nothing is just cut and pasted. Every scene has very intentional movement. I don't believe this series is CG done. Yeah, there are CG bits done. There are CG bits. Yes. But... To do a full pan around mm-hmm. of a 2D character, where oh, yeah. you have to constantly redraw the character and not lose the proportion as it's going. Because when rotating around an object, if anything's out of proportion, you immediately notice it. Yeah. You know? Especially with such an oblong shape as Pearl's head. Yeah. I could tell that wasn't done CG. Mm-hmm. It would have been tempting to do that CG because let the computer do all the hard work oh, yeah. on that. But, um, anyway, I just, like, that particular scene, that particular take was really impressive to me. Now, the contents of the song, you Yes, know, I think this is the first time that Pearl ever explicitly makes her feelings about Rose known. There are several times it's implied, there are several times, obviously, where we're led to make speculation or belief to how deep or how... Um, what type of love exists between Rose and Pearl. But I think with this, I would say almost completely uh, sealed in that Pearl had a very romantic love for Rose uh, that blossomed into jealousy when she um, loses to Greg. Mm -hmm. The very beginning of the song where she talks about like she was fine with the other men that she had been with in the past echoes what young pearl said in we need to talk yeah where she's like oh you're just a phase yeah you know and she mentions in this song like it's there's a lot of ties back to that other episode she mentions in this song at first it was just a game Mm -hmm. you know playing the 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 third wheel so to speak Mm -hmm. but then it became more than that and i think that's when she got you know confused Mm -hmm. and flustered and hurt and all the rest of it and you know she's only expressing these things because she believes that Stephen and Greg are asleep. Yeah. And then it's safe for her to do so. But that's not the case. Yeah, and I do appreciate <laughs> that uh, this episode actually touches a lot on the the unusual situation where in a musical, when everybody breaks out into song, by the time the song's over, everything goes back to normal as if that didn't just happen. Right. And um, several times uh, after this song and after the next song, uh, the scene comes back to reality but it's almost as if the song did actually happen. Everyone's there and witnessing mm-hmm. what's going on, which I just find um, somewhat humorous because of the the comparison to what normally happens in your traditional musical. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you get that really tense, like, almost embarrassed moment where, oh, Greg's there. He heard all of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everything gets really serious. You know, Greg's like, you know, I'm sorry you have to be with me or look at me or forget exactly what he says but he walks off and then pearl's like you know i shouldn't have come and then steven says this is exactly why i brought you here and at that point it's like oh steven's had a motive oh yeah the whole time Mm -hmm. for this again something that early in the episode it feels like it's just a whim and let's bring pearl yeah yeah now it's like oh no i brought you here to resolve this problem Mm -hmm. it seemed to have blown up in his face at that point yeah, um, to some degree. I think that Stephen knew things were going to have to reach ahead before they could be resolved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that is mirrored in Keystone Hotel. Because mm-hmm. before Ruby and Sapphire are able to resolve their internal conflict, they reached a point where it seemed like they were just going to be mad at each other for who knows how long. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it reached the point to where Stephen couldn't take it anymore, where he felt that 
he was the problem, they managed to put their differences aside. Right. And in this episode, Greg's the one that feels like he's the problem, and Pearl has to put her selfish uh, desires aside in order to come to terms with the fact that Greg's not actually the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now we get to the sixth song. (laughs) Things are really tense. And we go into the, the lobby of the hotel, and they're um, they're trying to resolve this. And suddenly, a rag starts playing yeah. on the piano. And uh, it's just one of those little icebreakers that you just like, um, like comic relief. Like, all of a sudden, oh, <laughs> okay. But anyway, then Stephen, who apparently can just play any instrument ever, plays this wonderful uh, song. And they get the chance to talk about their feelings, um, Greg and Pearl. And I think you had mentioned it was one of the most mature sure, yeah. conversations. It, yeah, I mean, to have two adults discussing the shared romantic love they had over a single person. And not only is that person now gone, and that's one thing that is serious enough that they need to discuss. But they're also coming to terms with the emotions they had towards each other in regards to the love that they had for someone else. And that's just a very mature, a very, you know, adult conversation to have. Oh, yeah. This episode is one of those that, like, elevates this show above, I'm going to go and say, anything else they've got going on that channel. Yeah, I mean, this is almost like listening to two parents talking about, like, getting divorced or something or, or... you know, having a new family member or new, like, uh, step-parent come into the picture or something. Mm-hmm. Like, this mm-hmm. is that level of conversation that you would expect not to show up in a light-hearted, jovial Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah, usually problems like this, even if they do come up in a show, are solved in such a, a kitschy, flashy way. Yeah. That it's just like, okay, everybody's happy now, yay. Yeah. You know, but no, and there's also parallels between this and the one with... Maximum Capacity. Ma- that's it. Yeah, Maximum Capacity, where um, the relationship between Greg and Amethyst is explored. Yeah. There's a very poignant look into Greg's personality. When Pearl finishes singing, he chooses to feel guilty. Not angry, mm. not upset in a vindictive sort of way, but... Greg still still feels, still sees himself as the outsider that interloped into what was otherwise a happy situation and ruined a bunch of lives. That's another thing that's been implied in other episodes. But yeah, it really comes out here that Greg feels responsible for everything that's happened. You know, it's painfully obvious that whatever Rose did to... Um, birth Stephen resulted in effectively her death. Yeah. Because that's the way it's been treated this whole time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in spite of everything else that we know about gems and how they can poof and regenerate and all this stuff, we know that Stephen is unique in this respect. So far as Pearl um, and Amethyst, at the very least, know, like, Rose is gone. She's not coming back Mm -hmm. at any point tons of speculation about all that yeah it's probably the the primary uh mystery of the show yeah but the song that steven sings is it's a very soft little i i always want to say it's like a bossa nova type of song Mm -hmm. but when he sings the lyric like because you love me and i love both of you yeah reminded me immediately of the one thing that rose said to steven in lion three like i'm a part of you and whenever you uh, like being you that's me loving you you yeah. know so rose's emotions come out through steven which is kind of like a duh yeah but maybe steven's sudden inspiration that this is an opportunity to bring these two together is an expression of rose trying to resolve something that she apparently could not resolve before steven was born yeah because i can imagine that once greg and rose were serious and once they knew that the this whole Steven thing was going to happen, that must have been very traumatic for Pearl. I can imagine Rose having a lot of personal regrets uh, not being able to mend the feelings between Greg and Pearl. And yeah, just Steven can sort of preternaturally sense that 
which might be a good reason of why he seems to be like wise beyond his years, especially when it comes to relationships and and especially with love, yeah, and all that. So yes, Mr. Greg is definitely one of my like five star episodes. Oh yeah, it's definitely up there with many of the flashback episodes in terms of just great quality throughout. Mm-hmm. But everything seems good. So let's go on to Wednesday. So after the <laughs> very <laughs> after the very emotional and deep Mr. Greg, we get an episode that's a lot more lighthearted and about Paradot and about Paradot, <sighs> who's got to be. The, the best most character. wonderful character. She's such a nerd. She's the best character. I love it. Um, you know, I once read that the most intelligent people on the internet like Paradot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do believe I saw a post on Tumblr about that. Just today. <laughs> and I wonder how I got there. <laughs> anyway, um, so here we have Too Short to Ride. And we start off with um, Paradot gets a tablet from Steven. She wow, immediately thanks. says, wow, thanks. <laughs> and this is such a great, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a running gag with Paradot. Every time she gets a gift, she just says, wow, thanks, which yeah. heralds back to uh, the Lock paint Day. cans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She goes through this really dramatic scene of her attaching the thing to her arm with the Velcro straps, which is what makes me say that she's such a nerd. Oh, yeah. I mean, aside <laughs> from that, she's, in the first, like, 30 seconds alone, there's that... She mistakes the concept of characters as in alphanumeric characters mm-hmm. as characters in like a TV show because she's a fan of Camp Pining Hearts. Mm-hmm. She goes goo goo gaga over tech. Which, by the way, she, according to her um, her Twitter account now, she's working on an almost thousand page long article about why, I believe it's Paulette, oh my is the worst character <laughs> in that show. Uh, um, you've really got to check check this out if yeah. you don't already know it's at paradot 5xg yeah it's it's an actual twitter um in the show she makes a uh was it cheaper, cheaper yeah. account and um but the the steven universe crew actually made an official twitter um and so go there follow paradot um i'm sure she'll appreciate it uh, in fact the tweets that she makes in this episode are in, in the, that yeah thing. it's a clod 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 clod, clod. <laughs> it's a very interesting like cross-platform mm-hmm. experience yeah just like the uh the keep each city weird blog yeah. yeah um so anyway when i first saw this episode and i first saw the preview i sincerely thought that it was going to be paradot amethyst and steven admittedly three of the less mature characters uh, that Amethyst was going to suggest using Fusion to be able to ride, so she was going to fuse with Peridot, and this was going to be a lesson in why they shouldn't fuse for frivolous reasons. I thought that was going to be the, the premise. Yeah, well, we had to wait for Friday for that one. Yes. But um, the, the more obvious answer for Amethyst, of course, was shape-shifting. Yeah. And then we find out Paradox can't shapeshift. Yes. Um, though Steven can shapeshift his legs in a comically long fashion, <laughs> and Amethyst can become, like, a teenager version of herself. I know, c- complete with the clothing and with everything. Backward baseball cap yeah. and tied off t-shirt. But, um, I want to point out, like, it's obvious that this episode is there for comic relief. It's a great, it's, it's, a, it's a bounce up from the Mr. Greg episode, because... Steven could have shapeshifted into his older self yeah. from Steven's birthday. His 14-year-old self. Yeah, and he would have been tall enough because they were, they just missed that height requirement anyway. Yeah. Uh, but no, we're going to go with the long, lanky legs. <laughs> yeah, um, and getting hit in, uh, Paradox getting hit in the face with the amethyst ball. Oh, and, man. Yeah, just th- them trying to stretch her out manually. Yes, there, there are a yeah. lot of very humorous notes in this episode. There were some bits of lore in this episode. Peridot says to Mr. Smiley that her size is indicative of her rank and position. Mm, and rarity. And rarity. Her rarity and position, yes. Um, which has been implied, because the diamonds are huge. Mm. Uh, Rose was a leader. She was rather tall. Mm-hmm. Garnet is the leader of the Crystal Gems. Now she is the tallest. Yeah. Well, that's uh, because of fusion. fusion. I know, but still, yeah. like, this is um, very important. Size is a very important thing. So maybe it's even when... He's telling her that she's too short for this thing. It's really kind of a slight. But she can't do that. She can't um, 
when the the little aliens, all of the aliens. Has, yeah, this weird obsession with the standard um, big-headed green aliens. Yeah. Because um, it's on the shorts that she wears. It's on mm-hmm. that, you know, stuffed animal that she wants. But they're green. Yeah. They're from another world. They're aliens. So I guess she kind of identifies. Yeah, it's got a large <laughs> head swollen with the, thoughts. The little one that they, that he puts on her finger is like adorable. Yeah. It's just... <laughs> then the revelation comes out that Parent doesn't have any powers. That's yeah. why she's got the limb enhancers. Yes. Which is a big question that we've had for a while. Whether she has powers or not. Because she doesn't manifest a weapon. Mm-hmm. She doesn't do anything else um she has the know-how but that's pretty much it yeah and the visor which i guess isn't necessarily a power since the rubies had it as well it's just yeah. an item i mm-hmm. guess um and what i think is interesting about this episode um the the first thing that comes up that's pretty uh serious is that amethyst tries to give peridot a pep talk about being herself or about um not mm. yeah about being able to see herself as more than she actually is or seeing herself as more than she thinks she is to look at herself from a positive point of view instead of a negative point of view and i think it's really important that it's amethyst that's giving that speech because she's the one who's usually down on herself thinks that she herself is flawed um wants to be more than she is I mean, maybe because Peridot's there, it gives her, it's like almost like the younger sister thing. It gives her a uh, a way of maturing mm-hmm. off of somebody else um, because it is an interesting development in her character arc. And I missed that when I watched it. I didn't notice that one. <laughs> Peridot then mentions something else interesting, that she's an Era 2 gem. Mm-hmm. And they don't have powers because there's not enough energy resources, resources on Homeworld or other planets that they've conquered. For them to make gems with powers and all this stuff. So it's like, uh, huh. Well, here's, yeah, where a lot of the rampant speculation can come in. Mm -hmm. Because, is this true? Are they actually running out of resources? Mm -hmm. Because it may just be a lie that they tell gems uh, that they don't have powers in this current era. Because something that I had posited uh, off mic was that era 2 implies that there's an era 1. Which implies there's a point by which they divide their eras. Now... My guess would be if we look at the symbology of Homeworld, Mm -hmm. it was always four colored diamond shape. The white, blue, pink, and yellow diamonds in a diamond shape. Now, once something happened, the pink iconography got gone. Yeah, was taken out. Um, this can be seen on the ship in uh, when Garnet and Jasper are fighting. Mm -hmm. Instead of having four diamonds there are three triangles right um normally this sort of iconography doesn't change unless something big happens and we're assuming yeah we're assuming that something happened to pink diamond right we're assuming it has to do with this uh war that rose was involved in yeah and i think it would be a strong enough point in homeworld's history possibly the first war they've ever lost to mark a new era now it would be important for the diamonds to ensure that other lesser gems couldn't rebel right ever again and so possibly they started breeding them without powers just so they couldn't Mm -hmm. or they're lying to them about it it could be that we could devote this much energy this large amount of energy to making one powerful gem Mm -hmm. or the same amount of energy into making two or maybe even three smaller gems of the same gem, but not with as many powers. Well, yeah. It's it's, it's almost equivalent to, if you want to keep your sub- subjects in charge or in in, um, in tow, you starve them. Because then they can't rebel. If they don't have enough energy to rebel, they can't rebel. Mm. Um, so, there's that. Also, leaning on the concept that what Peridot knows is true, this may be why Yellow Diamond is so focused on getting the cluster when Peridot contacts her, because... It would be a humongous energy source, at the least. Not only that, but it would be a great weapon to have. It would be a force of undeniable destruction. And if they can't make gem warriors that are strong enough to fight anymore, or to have even have powers... If that's true, then it could be the reason why the rubies were sent to get Jasper, was not to bring him to, like, trial or whatever, but because... They can't afford to lose a gem as powerful as Jasper is. Yeah. Um, So it's very interesting to 
review or to, to sort of uh, ponder on whether what Peridot knows from Homeworld is true or not. Because right. at the end of the episode... The, I was going to say, the biggest thing that lends credence to that is that we find out that she does have... She has a sort of magnetic telekinesis. A very magneto sort of power. Right. It should also be noted in real like, real world gemology that the same kind of uh, material that paradox come from Paradise is type. magnetic. magnetic. Mm-hmm. So... Yes. It's also really funny to see her reel in <laughs> the, the pa- iPad, yeah. You know? <laughs> but as soon as she gets it, she has it hovering over her hand in the same Just sort of like, position that the fingers would yeah. have been. And I think she's perfectly at Comfortable, home yeah. with this now. But that's that's pretty much it for Too Short to Ride, um, which brings us to... The new Lars. Which I think was my least favorite episode of the bunch. It was cute. It was. It's about the most... The, the biggest thing we learn is that Stephen can, like, dream walk into um, Living humans. Living people, yeah. Because we, we watched him do it into Malachite. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a gem. All right. We watched him do it to the Watermelon Stevens. Okay, well, he it's created them, yeah. so maybe that's something to do with it. And now he, he does this with Lars. And by the way, it's a really good thing that Steven's a good character because that's a scary power to have. Yeah, I think I mentioned <laughs> that in uh, our Super Watermelon and Island episode where I said that's basically mind control. That's mm. basically making people do whatever you want them to. This, of course, brings up the questions of what happens if Steven were to die while in someone else's body. But... For the time being, let's save that for another discussion. Right. I do want to mention, um, I, I got I give some credit to not only the people who animated Lars, but to Lars's voice actor mm-hmm. for acting like Steven with his mannerisms and everything like that. It was really done well. Like, you really believe that was Steven oh, in yeah. that body. Isn't that one of those old acting, you know, tests you don't just do a character's voice. You have to do Bugs Bunny impersonating Daffy Duck. Right. So, you know, I yeah. guess that's just another one of those things to show right. off your acting chops. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I just want to say it was really done well. Oh, yeah. Really done well. Mm-hmm. Um, Lars' parents are the nicest little couple oh, yeah. that I've ever seen. And it's the first time you've ever seen them. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't... I mean, I'd have to troll back to the episode to see if they were ever in the background. And I don't think so, because those are some pretty specific looking character yeah. models. And just, they're just normal parents. They just want their son to do well. They're trying to give him a space to give him the attic mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But they want him to do well in school, and he's not. And it's just all this. And of course, Steven, being Steven's like, you guys are so nice. I don't want to do anything to disappoint you. And they and they buy it. And it's almost tragic. Oh, because yeah. Because you know it's not really him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so one of the, if not the primary issue in the episode is the tenuous relationship that Sadie and Lars have. Yeah. Because as we've seen in the past, Sadie obviously has a pretty significant crush on Lars Mm -hmm. and their relationship is just so hard to watch sometimes because you can tell that Sadie is this sort of pure hearted, you know, very innocent individual who has these feelings for a guy who's honestly not that great of a no. person. No, see, Lars is a jerk, but feels like somebody who is capable of learning. It's mm-hmm. really difficult because he he must have some kind of insecurity that he's constantly trying to cover over. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that it goes all the way back to, um, what is it, Horror Club, mm-hmm. where we see young Lars and young Ronaldo... And when young Ronaldo has this picture of, you know, his belief that it's proof of uh, something something supernatural, um, Lars looks kind of ridiculous in it, and he immediately destroys it. Um, So Lars is very obviously obsessed with his image. Yeah. um, Which is what causes this rift between himself and Sadie, because as I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later, I do believe that he honestly has feelings for Sadie. Oh, yeah. I think that if nothing else... He would like to date her or like to go out with her or whatever, but he's so obsessed on maintaining his cool guy persona and Sadie doesn't fit into that. Right. Later on, one of the cool kids um, refers to Sadie as the donut girl. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, so that's obviously a demarcation of an outsider. She doesn't even, they don't even know her name. So she's not, quote-unquote, cool. Right. I also want to point out that Stephen said that these two had feelings for each other 
well before the audience ever saw any hint of it. Steven just knows. Yeah, you know? yeah, he's very perceptive when it comes to these sorts of things. And I mean, at least as far as we are in this point in the story, he was there for, um, Ed, what is it? Be Wherever You Are, I mm -hmm. believe is that song, yeah. So what ends up happening in the end is that Lars comes over to Sadie's house. Um, she obviously overlooks how much of a jerk he is again. Uh, she calls him the human boomerang because Notice he's... how her defenses are up. Oh, yeah. Well, he shows up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he. She again, she calls him the human boomerang. Obviously, this happens all the time. Obviously, he probably puts her down because he realizes that she's not cool. In front of other people. Yeah. Goes to hang out with the cool people. They put him down. And so he goes back to her because he knows that she'll accept him. Not a healthy relationship. Oh, God, no. <laughs> um, And yeah, I, I've often questioned what Sadie sees in Lars I don't know. I can, just can't see what someone as like sweet and wholesome and just great as Sadie sees in someone who's see, just such a straight up jerk. <laughs> see, Sadie seems to me like she's the very like the the everyman kind of character, mm -hmm. and she's got this really overbearing mother mm -hmm. character that we've met before, and I don't see any other like guys giving her any attention. The fact yeah. that she works with Lars kind of. It's convenient because yeah. they're with each other all the time. And I guess um, Lars has in the past indicated that he may have had feelings for her uh, because of the whole, um, you know, he called me his player two thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they've spent some personal time together. Heaven knows how far that goes. So her emotions are probably being very much toyed with in that regard. So she can't let go of that either. She's probably started to develop feelings for him and now she just can't let them go. And Stephen's whole thing is like, okay, you guys know you like you love each other. Just get on with it. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't understand you know. the the issue, um, the social decorum at all. Almost just like how um, back in Mister Greg, he was like, "Why don't you just talk about this problem?" Yeah, you're right there. Just mm -hmm. talk about it. Yeah, you know. And Sadie does try to accomplish that in this episode. Now, admittedly. It's while Steven's still in Lars's head, but, you know, they, they get to that point where Sadie says to him, I just need you to tell me what's going on here, how you feel. It's funny. Everybody else accepts the Steven Lars at face value. And they're like, wow, like he's really turned over a new leaf. This is all great. But they don't know him like Sadie does. Oh, and yeah. so when Steven acts like Steven, but in Lars's body... Said he ain't having it. Mm. And I think that really confuses Steven because, you know, that's not definitely not how he expected that to, to turn out. Well, yeah, because like you said, Sadie's defenses are always up around Lars. And when he starts laying on the schmutz, you know, the... Mm. The, the sappy movie. The sappy movie, the uh, gauges, in a very dramatic way, revealing his love for her. She probably... Well, she says... This is all crap. You're just doing this to keep me on a tether so that the next time you need to come back to me, I'll accept you. And she kicks him out. Yep. <laughs> and that's... Well, say with this thing for Sadie. She is strong. Oh, yeah. She... I really like Sadie as a character. Yeah, she kicks the door open, too, later to the temple. Yeah, I'm I'm waiting for some time in the future when something serious is happening and she's actually able to, like, participate in oh, some way. yeah. One of my headcanons is that the war for Earth is going to occur again, mm -hmm. and they're going to need not only gems, but humans on the front line to help, and Sadie's going to be there. Sadie's going to be one of the people who's going to fight against Homeworld. Right. Particularly if, as we said before, all the gem weapons are specifically effective against gems. They don't harm humans at all. Yeah. So that's like... A big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, aside from just explosions and stuff, I'm yeah. sure those are harm humans. But, <laughs> um, anyway, you know, Stephen finally confesses that it's him. Yeah, and she she recognizes that she that finally it's him. takes it, and they go with <laughs> Stephen. Meanwhile, dragging half of Beach City along with them. Yeah, but basically, all the people that he's already interacted with, the cool kids, his parents, and they all go up into the bedroom. And I, I like I like the scene when Stephen wakes up. And you get that moment of, of Lars kind of like almost brain dead for a moment before his, he like passes out or whatever. 
Um, like that, that's really well done. Like, yeah. what does that transition look like? Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and then Lars absolutely freaks out. Oh yeah, he completely <laughs> blows his stack. Um, and I think it's great that uh, there's actually the moment where the cool kids step up to defend Steven. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah because they know they all say that they like him. Yeah. Just, I want to note, uh, back when uh, Lars, uh, Stevens Lars, was talking to the cool kids, and Buck steps forward, and it's like, oh, I see what's going here, going on here, da 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 I was like, I know this parallels with me before, but he so much sounds like Garnet. Oh, yeah. When he's talking about that, he's very, like, prescient, mm-hmm. and, um, I mean, he obviously doesn't have, like, future vision powers. No. Or anything like that, but... The the parallel between their personalities was really strong right there. Mm-hmm. But um since Lars' whole like psyche is based around his image, we have the situation where Steven may have, in the span of one day, destroyed the image that he has been projecting. Well, I don't think he destroyed the image because everybody knows that it was Steven. Well, I'm talking about how Lars felt that moment in the temple, like when he first woke up, mm-hmm. and then like, you know, it was told to him that when he says, Oh, so, like, you were my body and you acted nice to people and they liked it? Poof. Yeah. You know well, what I mean? I think the bigger issue at hand here is that Stephen reveals that nobody actually genuinely likes Lars. Mm. I think that's really what the issue is. And now Lars is forced to come face to face with the truth, which is the thing that he's trying to either remedy or avoid, which is that he isn't cool. He isn't popular. And... Steven, who he views as a dweeb or a geek, actually managed to be a better cool kid than he ever did. Mm -hmm. And in his body. So the only thing that could possibly be bad is Lars's personality. Right. And so we get the payoff at the end. Steven comes into the big donut. Lars is really super depressed. Here's a card with a koala and yeah, a just on tears it. it straight up. Doesn't even look at it. Yeah. But then Steven uh, said, I'm sorry if I ruined your relationship with Sadie. And he's like, oh, what did you say to her? Like, oh my God, what did you say to her? Mm. Oh, I told her that, that you loved her. And he was like, boom. Yes. Like he passes out or something. It falls off the... But, yeah. but he pops up with his eyes wide and he's like, what did she say? Yes. Like, aha. Yes, that's... You care. <laughs> yes, that's the big revealing point that Lars obviously does have feelings for Sadie. Because mm-hmm. instead of getting, like, mad, or instead of just, like, brushing it off because it's Sadie who cares what she thought, mm-hmm. he's legitimately interested in knowing what Sadie said when Stephen confessed, quote-unquote, for him. Right. And Stephen was true in saying that she felt that, like, you would only say that to hurt her. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, yeah, you're probably right. And it's like, he really has learned something here. I want to see what the next episode that has Lars in it is going to be like. If he's going to go back to form or there's going to be some kind of indication that he's really learned something from this incident. I think that, uh, if anything, we'll probably see him still being his Larsly self, um, but maybe slightly less hurtful mm-hmm. in intention two really small things one so his actual name is laramie yes yes we learned that his yeah. real name's laramie um which is interesting yeah i've never heard that name before really yeah there's a lot of theory uh, about lars's gender actually oh um yes and i don't want to go into it too much now because it would deserve its own episode but um there are feelings that or opinions that lars um may be transsexual and um, since Laramie's a gender neutral name, um, since the mother, um, you know, switches quickly switches over to the name Lars, possibly right. a new name he chose after transitioning. You know, there's a lot right, of hints right. there. I also, it's funny, but when I saw the episode, I saw that scene. I interpreted that as, oh, right, that's your like, that's cool your cool name, name yeah. and you don't want to be known by your more lame name. Yeah, as, well, you know. again. As the show just tends to be in general, there are so many different ways to perceive it, to perceive any one interaction, and Mm. that could be for censorship reasons. Yeah. You could perceive it as this is his cool persona versus his, you know, lame persona, or it could be, you know, this was his old life and this is his new life. Right. I mean, it's almost like that thing where you have the, when you're going, when you're high school and you know these other people... 
You just know their names. You may not even be friends with them, but you know their names. But then you go to graduation and they read out their full formal name and you're like, what? Yeah. You're blah, 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 the fourth? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> anyway, the second thing I wanted to point out real quick is that Onion, yes. who is normally completely expressionless, like he never shows anything remotely like an expression, gets absolutely creeped out yeah. by Stephen or Lars acting like Stephen. Because he's like, I'm Lars, and, and, and he's like, okay. Yeah. Like, that's interesting, because, like, I mean, never shows any sort of emotion about anything, really. Yeah, I think that was to drive the point home that this was just really awkward, mm. um, that Onion, even Onion, is weirded out by this. Right. I think that's enough for the new Lars. Yep, um, so let's move on to... The fifth and final episode. Beach City Drift. Which I really liked. I really liked this episode. Yeah, I found this episode entertaining. Um, this episode probably ties for second place, in my opinion, of this week. Um, mostly because I'm a huge Peridot fan, which ties it with uh, Too Short to Ride. Mm. This episode, I also deemed as The Return of Kevin. Yes. Because, um, who could have been a one-time episode villain, actually right. reprises his role as... You know, local jerk. Local teenage jerk. <laughs> yeah. Even even outdoing Lars, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. But when I said this, this week has been full of jerks. We had, <laughs> we had Marty, and then we had some Lars, and now we've got a dose of Kevin. <laughs> and uh, Marty is, he, he's just a creep. He's not going to change. He, you know, whatever. I, I really want to believe that Lars, Lars is, is going to change. Yeah. Um, Kevin, on the other hand, I think he got a good a good, a good burn yeah. from this episode. Whether that actually changes him or not, who knows? But this also means we get a healthy dose of Stefani. Yes, yes. So hail, hail, Stefani is here again, and <laughs> I couldn't be happier. Though I did hope the next time we'd see her, she would be battling something. Right. Um, I do think that this did a good job of closing the the circle that Kevin opened. And I'm I'm going to try to to speak about this in the most delicate way as possible because I think that this episode is an allegory. Mm -hmm. Um and I think this episode is an allegory for abuse. Mm -hmm. And again, I know that this is a very sensitive subject, so I don't want to talk about it too openly, but I think that this episode shows the many ways in which people can be affected by and can respond to abuse. Yeah. I think that one of the things you had said previously is that this is one of the few times we actually see Steven... Like, angry. Yeah. Not just upset, not just a little, like, angry, but he's just not about Kevin at all. Right. It, it's really unique because... Even the bona fide villains in the story, from Peridot to the Cenobitel to the Cluster, he tries to redeem. Yes. And he has no time for Kevin at all. Yeah. Straight up anger. He uses the word hate. and <laughs> That four-letter word. That four-letter word. <laughs> you know. Though creeps five letters. Five letters, yeah. And it's like, whoa. Like, this is so out of character for him. Mm -hmm. But... Um, when we started talking about the allegory yes. um, interpretation, you realize that he didn't just have this experience as Steven. He had this experience as Stevani, yes. and that makes a big difference. Yes, I think that both Steven and Connie were abused, and they take two very divergent, um, at least in the beginning, paths in responding to that abuse. Steven takes the more direct approach, the aggressive, the outward anger, mm -hmm. um, the acting on pure emotion, pure instinct, that this person did something wrong to me and I want them to suffer for it. I want them to get what's coming to them. Right. Um, whereas Connie has the much more introverted anger. She draws it in instead and has it probably a more seething rage bottled up inside of her. And this is why I've seen people make comparisons between Stephen and Connie and Ruby and Sapphire. Yeah, um, it's very similar. Uh, and it all sort of comes to a head or a reveal when they're sitting on the hood of the car, of Greg's uh, new used car. Yeah. Um, and Connie says she is angry, but she's thinking angry. She, she's got, she d that anger is there, and they need to think of a way to get rid of that feeling. Right. 
And to extend the analogy, when Ruby and Sapphire are both angry with Pearl, mm-hmm. um, because of Pearl's like abuses of fusion, yeah, right, because they didn't talk about their different ways of interpreting their anger, mm-hmm. we had the Keystone Motel Incident. episode, yeah. So these two. It might even be stated, might even be a more stable relationship than Garnet is, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But um, they do still have a lot to learn because they decide that they're going to beat Kevin in his own game by entering the drag race yep. with this car that, compared to that really sporty looking... Up sports car. Car that apparently has nitro in it. Has <laughs> a nitro sport, yeah. Yeah. With this boxy, dumpy, something from... They say 96, but it looks like something from the 70s, if you ask me. You know? Well, I mean, Greg says that it's from the era of frosted tips and, uh, what is it, slap, slap bracelets. bracelets yeah. Which is the 90s, you know. Yeah. So, they decide to fuse. Yeah. Um, they decide to fuse because they can drive as... Uh, as Stevani because they look like a teenager right but it also allows Kevin to recognize uh Stevani again right right and um also we've talked before about how the people in this world just kind of accept the magical, magical stuff. things that happen so you're those two kids yeah like, you know, the whole two kids in a beautiful trench coat <laughs> routine yeah. like uh the two kids in a trench coat thing yeah. uh but anyway uh, but um, yeah it's, he just accepts that, not like, that's super weird. I mean, he thought it was super weird when they defused, and he was like, whoa. People you know. are just really accepting in this world. Something strange happens once, yeah. but if it happens again, whatever, I've seen this before. Yeah, they have um, they probably have to do that, or they waste a lot of time. I mean, they saw a giant floating hand crash into their home world. Yeah. So they go to do the drag race, and I would not have expected Ronaldo to be the one who would know like the lore behind the cars. I mean, yes, he he is a he is a a geek. I think he's but... just a font of esoteric knowledge on mm. you know very niche things. Yeah, it's just uh, I guess maybe in my experience, the type of people who are interested in the type of stuff that Ronaldo's interested in, automotive is really not there. Well, you know? I mean. Okay, so let's just say that um, this episode is obviously a parody of Fast and the Furious Mm -hmm. and also um, Initial D, which, um, since that's probably a little less commonly known in regular circles, is an anime uh, from the early 90s uh, about drag racing and about drifting. Um, There's actually a video game based on it as well that's a racing game. But there's always in these situations the one character who's really knowledgeable intellectually about things, Mm -hmm. but usually isn't very good in practice. Right, they don't actually know how to drive it properly. Yeah, Yeah. so he's sort of filling that trope in this instance. Right, okay. So they decide to do the race, taunting and everything. Like, Kevin's just the worst. Yes, yes. And they get to the top of the um, hill, and uh, Kevin says something that sets up the conclusion of the episode, which is, there's some really nice views from up here, mm-hmm. but too bad you won't looking see at my them. Tail you're looking at my tail lights, yeah. okay? And then he goes before the hour. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, jerk. <laughs> but yeah, they they end up racing. Stevani can tap into the magic of the Dondi. They she just knows how to drive it. I mean, yeah. even people like I know. You know, I've been driving for years and years, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to employ the parking brake to do you know like the drift, but. <laughs> They end up crashing because of this really strange sort of, like... Things got really trippy Yeah, for a alternate there. world vision that Stevani has, where the road starts falling apart behind them. The sky gets all trippy. Yeah, and, and like, Kevin's face shoots out of the yeah. taillights. Yeah, and my, my biggest theory for what that whole scene was, was that might have been the moment of them defusing. Yeah, that could have been them splitting apart. But I'm I'm trying to think allegorically if this means that their obsession with Kevin is literally making their world fall apart. And his mm. image literally consumes them. Mm. So... Because he's been taunting them the whole time. Yeah. And he, um, he gets in their head. Yeah. Um, including the scene that I almost got angry about. Because... Kevin starts giving him a sob story. Yeah, he gives them this sort of uh, this thing about a sick tragic and all that. story. And I'm like, no, please, please do not redeem every character. Yeah. Well, because you just you know you want to have some characters that are just jerks, like they have yeah. no redeemable qualities, right? And so he's giving the sob story, and of course, Stevani 
because, you know, they actually do care about these things. They start softening and then he starts laughing and is like, I do this just because it's funny. And I'm just like, please draw that sword and shield. And yes. Kill him now. Well, <laughs> that's another to, again, draw the allegory. Um, a lot of times abusers will try to make themselves out to be the victims mm. or will try to rationalize the reason why they abuse or lash out at people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might, those events might be true. The things that they're stating might be true, but that doesn't give you the excuse to hurt other people. Right. And right. in Kevin's case, it's not only is he abusive, but he's also manipulative because he just straight up lies. Now, I don't know if this character's ever going to show up again, but it is possible that there is a rational explanation for why he behaves the way he does. But like I said, that still doesn't give, give you him... an excuse for being a jerk. Um, he could be another one that comes from a household that looks otherwise perfectly normal and routine, and he's just a jerk because he's rebelling against that yeah. background. You yeah. know, not unlike Lars, honestly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the one thing that they point out was that their biggest mistake was that they let kevin get into their head and they fused because of it and i'm sure they've both been trained especially from garnet that you don't fuse yeah. except for special fusion circumstances. is yeah, serious business and to fuse over someone like kevin who as greg puts it earlier in the episode shouldn't even be worth their time um mm -hmm. is almost sacrilegious yeah here we get to see um greg being the dad yeah being the one who says I just got basically verbally abused by this guy, you know, mm -hmm. he drove off without even paying for his, his waxing or whatever. And he's like, but eh, um, he's not, he's not worth the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, again, bringing back the allegory, um, I think what the episode is trying to impart is that the worst thing you can do if somebody hurts you or, or. Um, manipulate you is to continue to let them have that power mm -hmm. to continue to invest all of that energy into that person because right. you are worth so much more your time could be going to so many more creative things so many more right. helpful things like, um, like why do we have to play his game yeah now the game has been uh, allegorically the the drag race, the race yeah but yeah so what ends up happening is that they decide that they're going to, you know, finish the race, but for them. Mm -hmm. So they don't even give them the time of day as they start the race again. And they get to see the beautiful view. Yes. Mm -hmm. So once they manage to realize that he's not worth it, um, yeah, he did some terrible things, but we can't obsess over that. Um, they actually enjoy themselves. They have a mm -hmm. great time together. They, they get to see a beautiful view. And yeah, they end up losing the race. Right. Though so when they get to the bottom, he tries to rub it in their face and they don't care. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they've realized that if they stop letting him control how they feel, they can start to feel good again. And my favorite part, probably about the whole episode, is that when they go to leave, when Stevani goes to leave, Kevin realizes that they've sort of broken free from his manipulative chains. Right. And he can't take it. And he can't handle it. He starts yeah. to fall apart. Because You're obsessed with me. that's what gives him purpose. Right. Is knowing that people are obsessed with him. And once he starts to lose that control, he just falls apart because he mm. realizes that he's lost. He doesn't have anything. That's just that's how the the abuser ends up falling out in this uh, situation, in this allegory. Right. And they've also managed to defeat an enemy without weapons, mm -hmm. without anything. Yeah. So I think that this was a really great episode. Even without the allegory, it's a very good lesson on nonviolent resolutions to mm -hmm. problems. And, and how to deal with people who are, well, jerks. Yes. <laughs> and um, the race scenes are really cool. Oh yeah, as well. The racings are really cool. I mean, I mean, on, on the technical points, it was it was well done as a reference to like Fast and the Furious and all that. It was fun. I found I found the episode to be fun. Thus ends week one. Week one of, of the Summer, Summer of Stephen. I think it's a good start. Yeah, no, now, they definitely came out of the door swinging. Yeah, and I think if I had any overall impressions about this, it's a lot of setup. There's not really any battling 
going on no in here. um but There's I, a lot of character development yeah um one of the overlying themes that i thought kind of linked each of these episodes together because unlike previous Stephen bombs like the week of sardonyx for example where there was sort of a an overlying um mini series feel as in every episode kind of directly related to each other mm -hmm. Uh, these episodes don't. The only undercurrent is the whole, Greg's got money now. Yeah. But he doesn't know how to spend it, apparently. Yeah. But I think the, um, the thing that links them all together is that there's a lot of relationship mending. Mm -hmm. Um, or at least a lot of very microscopic perspective into the relationships in the stories. So there's Greg and Pearl. Mm -hmm. Steven tries to mend their relationship. There's, there's Sour Cream and Yellowtail. Yeah, and they try to mend their relationship there's Kevin and Stevani right. and they try to mend their relationship insofar as trying they to resolve it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, well, and then there's, um, Sadie and Lars again. Yeah. <laughs> then... The only episode that doesn't really fit the theme is too short to ride. Right. I mean, that does show some interesting relationship beats with Herodot and Amethyst. Mm -hmm. So as usual, do feel free to contact us by, uh, Email, Twitter, Tumblr, any of those social media outlets. And in fact, we just recently got a shout out from Rose Quartz Queen yes. on Tumblr. Yes. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we've actually reblogged the the mention. Um, so if you want to go to our Tumblr page, again, it's Rose Quartz Queen. Um, you can find her post there. Um, and you can go check out her stuff. And we just want to say, if you're still listening, thank you very much for the shout out. It means a lot to us to know that people are out there and listening. Yep. And that they're enjoying what they're hearing. Yeah. Yay. So <laughs> as long as you keep listening, we'll keep talking. That's it for this Any, week. Yeah. Next week. Week two. Week two. Oh, and man. Whew. I've already got to go back and watch Restaurant, Restaurant Wars. Wars. Yeah. Yes. I've already seen it. So <laughs> anyway. Thank you guys very much for coming out, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.